think we can get started now. Um, so again, welcome everyone to this Euro Heat and Power webinar um, on Heat Networks 4.0. This webinar is part of a series titled Ideas That Move Us Forward, where Euro Heat and Power members were asked to put forward and present their ideas uh, on how we can move the district heating and cooling sector forward. My name is Jack Roscadden. Uh, I work for the DAT Plus technology platform as a project assistant and I will be your moderator for today's discussion. And today's discussion will focus on maximizing renewables and minimizing losses in heat networks, as well as the fast implementation of long lasting networks. And so can I have the next slide, please? So I'm just gonna go through a few of the housekeeping rules for today. And so firstly, this event will be recorded. I'd ask all attendees to ensure that your mic is muted when you are not speaking. Uh, you, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can post the question in the chat box or alternatively, you can raise your hand and I will then call on you to ask your question. Um, in terms of timings, there will be two 15 minute presentations followed immediately by five minutes of Q&A and then we will finish up with a 20 minute joint discussion and attendees are invited to ask questions at any time. So I'll now uh, introduce our speakers for today. So our first speaker is Christian Engel. International Business Development Manager for District Heating and Cooling at Outroflex. Christian is a dear friend of your heat and power and is an expert in low temperature district heating and pre-insulated piping systems with over 40 years of experience in the sector. So he works to develop sustainable and energy efficient solutions for district heating and cooling distribution networks in close cooperation with leading energy suppliers. Our second presentation today will be delivered by Lorenz Leppin. Uh, Lorenz is a scientific researcher at AEE Intech uh, Institute for Sustainable Technologies, and he works in the cities and networks department. Uh, so his research looks at modeling, simulation, and analysis of energy systems with a focus on heat networks. And Lorenz is no stranger to Euroheat and Power, having participated in our summer school in Ljubljana two years ago. Um, so I'll now invite Christian to begin his presentation. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Welcome to everyone joining this seminar. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, motivate you uh, to go a bit faster into the direction of uh, fully sustainable district energy. What you will get from uh, us, from Austroflex um, and from myself, we talk about Heat Networks 4.0, the challenges and advantages, uh, several insights on district heating piping systems and the concrete use case. And my colleague from a Intec will then go into uh, lower temperatures, even cold district uh, heating systems. But where are we coming from? Uh, I think this picture is, is well known uh, to most of you. Uh, we're coming from relatively high temperatures and our goal is to reduce temperatures in existing networks and for new networks to a level below 60 degrees. And this is what we call here heat networks 4.0. Uh, it's similar to what you call fourth generation district heating. From my experience, um, there are a couple of uh, challenges uh, in existing district heating networks to come down with the temperatures. There are certain flow temperatures more or less guaranteed in contracts uh, for existing buildings uh, that you cannot uh, change easily. Uh, you have non-optimized heating systems in the houses uh, and the transport capacity of the existing uh, district heating networks uh, is limited uh, because they were designed for higher flow rates uh, and especially higher flow temperatures and uh, temperature differences. If you go into new built areas, then we are facing very low heating loads uh, due to new uh, construction regulations. We are facing, on the other hand, minimum temperatures for uh, domestic hot water for example, for Legionella prevention. And again, uh, a bit surprised 
uh, surprises, we are facing again a non-optimized heating system in the houses, in the buildings. But there are a lot of advantages why we all should really strive for low temperatures. Heat loss reductions of up to 50% are possible. Um, when you see uh, this uh, overview that we have made based on a, a one uh, kilometer network, uh, we calculated annual uh, heat losses of different networks. And we were taking uh, pre-insulated steel pipes, series one, as the benchmark. And for the reduction of temperatures from 95 to 80, uh, you save 21%, or even 35 if you reduce to 70, or 50% if you reduce to 60 degrees. We took uh, always the same delta T for, uh, for all cases. Interesting, uh, if we compare this to a typically uh, pre-insulated flexible pipe system, uh, our Austropur system, uh, we get to uh, a similar heat loss uh, like Steel Series 2. If we use Austropur Plus, uh, we are equal to Steel Series 3. For comparison, uh, I've also uh, displayed the Austropex system, which is a typical uh, system for short connection lines and for heat pumps, uh, which has definitely higher heat losses compared to polyurethane insulated systems. Another important point and, and experience, uh, I'm, and I'm 40 years in this business, uh, is the overall lower investment and the higher speed. Uh, I mean, most of, for most of you, it's obvious that the flexible pipe uh, has very long pipe lengths, uh, is cutting the number of connections. Uh, our experience is that you can save 75% of installation time and cost uh, for flexible systems. Important is also the, the saving in terms of smaller trenches, meaning civil works of 30 to 40 percent due to smaller trenches and easier, easier routing due to flexibility. A downside, as it seems, is uh, the higher cost of pipes. So if you compare just the bare pipe, straight pipe, without T's, uh, branches, uh, sockets, just the pipe steel to plastic. Uh, then uh, if you go to a, a range up to DN 150, you might face uh, up to 50% higher pipe prices. But take into consideration that's only 20 to 30% of the total price, uh, then you still get uh, 15 to 20% or even higher advantage for flexible plastic pipes. Lifetime increase, another advantage uh, in general for low temperature, uh, but especially interesting for uh, plastic solutions. Uh, in EN 15632, we have defined uh, 80 degrees as the normal uh, operating temperature. Um, and here we are talking always about 24-7 uh, uh, operations of 80 degrees. Uh, then you uh, reach about 32 years of lifetime for a PEX pipe, but only five degrees lower uh, temperature level uh, increases the lifetime significantly to over 50 years. If you go further down to 65, and that's what we are talking with uh, in fourth generation, then you reach 100 years of lifetime. I want to show you an uh, an example that has been uh, installed in the last years and is now in operation since 2018. This is in the southern part of Austria, uh, in, in Villach. Uh, a, a quite a nice uh, living area uh, close to a, a lake on the uh, borders of, of Villach. 
217 apartments uh, with a total floor space of 24,000 square meter. They use apartment stations with instant hot water supply. The uh, heat is coming from solar thermal, uh, about 1,000 square meter. They had originally planned 1,400, um, but uh, due to building regulations, they were only allowed for, for 1,000. The heat storage, uh, taking the, uh, the overflow from the uh, thermal heating, uh, 68 uh, cubic meters, a groundwater heat pump with about 150 uh, kilowatts and a connection to the Villach district heating system as a, as a backup, especially in the, in the heating period. We've installed 750 uh, three meters uh, district heating network uh, with Austropur Plus which has been chosen by the investor due to its high flexibility uh, with a high insulation value at the same time. I've been last week uh, in, uh, uh, in the project uh, and have checked with the operator what is the uh, experience after, let's say, the first full heating period and uh, also in terms of investment. They said uh, that compared to a biomass district heating uh, that they use for, for other projects, uh, it's a 20% uh, cost increase. However, uh, the, uh, the building developer wanted to have a real green uh, uh, application uh, and, and is selling it, it under the fully sustainable solution. The supply temperatures, interesting, uh, are varying uh, and going up to 72 degrees, return 42. Um, this is especially in the summer months when the heat demand is, is at zero and just uh, the uh, domestic hot water is, is used. Interesting also, uh, some customers are complaining about the relatively high heat price. Um, they said my, uh, the, the solar heating should be practically for free, so it should be cheaper. The heat price is uh, on a similar level like uh, Villach district heating, so it's, it's not a, uh, a special markup for the, for the green energy that they are using. The project has already been awarded uh, with the Energy Globe, Carinthia and the Solar Award in Austria. Uh, our colleagues from AINTEC um, have been uh, monitoring uh, from December 2018 to November 2019. Uh, and you can see a typical uh, spread of the usage uh, of the different uh, supplies. Uh, the yellow and the, the red part of the bar uh, is representing the solar. Uh, the blue part uh, is the uh, heat pump and the green part is coming from uh, the district heating in Villach, uh, which is also relatively green district heating coming uh, from uh, industrial waste heat uh, and uh, biomass. Overall, uh, in the first period, the solar share was 32%, heat pump 11 and district heating 57%. In, in 2019, they were able to uh, back uh, uh, supply 20,000 kilowatt hours into the district heating network of uh, Villach. To conclude, uh, with heat networks 4.0, uh, you can uh, create much lower heat losses and you can save additionally uh, 36% if you go from standard uh, steel series one to uh, an equivalent to steel series three, uh, like Austropur Plus, which has been used in this uh, project. You can significantly increase the lifetime to uh, up to 100 years uh, for these kind of networks. And 
you can uh, apply uh, fast and cost efficient network types with uh, flexible systems like, like our Austropure. The special uh, reason for using uh, our system in this project uh, was a decision of the installer uh, who has been uh, testing various piping systems and uh, our Austropur has been uh, the most flexible system in the in the poor systems. Just a, a very brief uh, summary of what Austroflex is doing uh, in uh, district heating. So we have uh, flexible uh, low temperature piping systems with pure insulation, with PEX insulation. Uh, we have uh, customized uh, mineral wool segments for uh, steel pipes and uh, storage tanks. And we produce solar thermal pipe systems for underground and above ground solutions. With this, I, I would like to close uh, my part uh, of this webinar. You have my contact details uh, uh, here. Uh, what I want to say is that Aust Austroflex uh, is internationally uh, operating with a lot of uh, very experienced partners in different uh, countries. So uh, we are happy to receive your questions uh, right now or afterwards. Thank you very, very much. And uh, let's let's make uh, heat networks 4.0 uh, a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for this presentation on Austroflex's activities and on the heat and capex savings offered by uh, heat networks 4.0. I see there was already a question about the effect of the higher water temperature on the lifetime of the pipe. Um, well, this has already been answered by Ingo Lusbrook, who will also join us for the discussion um, later on after the next presentation. Ingo is the head of the Cities and Networks Department at AEE Intech. Um, so Christian, you mentioned that there are overall capex savings of between 15 to 20 percent in the plastic over steel pipe. Yeah, um, yeah. With the reduced uh, heat losses, are there also significant operational expenditure savings? Uh, yes, sure. I mean, we have <clears throat> we have two two kind of savings. The first saving is comparing, let's say, the heat losses uh, from high temperature, let's say 95 uh, to 60 degrees. Uh, is is giving you a gain of of 50% reduction, uh, and the second uh, gain is if you choose for for new uh, built networks, if you choose for the highest insulation class equal to uh, series three steel or Austropur plus system. So in this in this way you you have a double uh, advantage, and what we see also in uh, in the Lanscom case is that especially during summertime uh, you are still uh, have significant uh, let's say losses in the network that so the overall losses for for landscone are calculated and, and measured with with 16 percent which is uh, quite a good value for for such a network i, I have to say from my experience great thank you um, you also mentioned that non-optimized heating systems and buildings uh, present a barrier both to existing um, existing networks and new builds. Um, so do you think is this a major barrier to the rollout of these networks in the future or how can this be overcome? Well, uh, I've, I've been uh, joining some EU programs uh, like, like Tempo uh, and that that topic has been raised uh, and is a, a special topic with uh, existing areas where uh, the district heating companies are often uh, stopping their activities at the at the house entry so they have in, in the beginning they have very little influence on on the house uh, uh, renovations and the uh, installations in the house so that's uh, that we have to overcome uh, and we are looking for 
uh, new regulations, uh, especially also in, in terms of, of the renovation of buildings where district energy uh, uh, is becoming more and more important in, in the cities. Yes, absolutely. And I think this will be a major focus of the upcoming renovation wave. Um, exactly, yeah. So we have a question from the audience um, relating to how the warm water is um, is increased from medium to high temperatures at the building level, which um, obviously refers to heat pumps. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how the system interacts at the heat pump level? Uh, you mean uh, in the in the existing projects in, in, in Lanscon? I mean, uh, the, the concept there is, is built uh, in such a way that in each of the, the individual uh, apartment buildings, uh, there is a, uh, a storage tank uh, in addition in the in the basement. So the, the, the hot water uh, is uh, upgraded and on, on that level and then distributed because at the house, at the apartment stations, you need 60 degrees uh, uh, as a for the instant hot water supply. So the heat pump is, uh, let's say, adding uh, uh, temperature uh, in the storage tanks. But it's a centralized in the in the boiler house. It's it's not decentralized. Decentralized systems will be introduced and, and uh, we will come to that more uh, in the second presentation. Great, thank you, Christian. And with that, I think we, we can move on to the second presentation as I don't see any questions in the chat box right now, but we'll come back to you soon um, for the joint discussion. So thanks Great. again, Christian. Thank you very um, much. And yeah, I'd now invite Loren Sleppin to uh, begin your presentation. Okay. So hello, everyone, also from my side. My name is Lorenz Lepin. I'm, as said already, a researcher at the Institute for Sustainable Technologies in Gleisdorf in Austria. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Christian, for the interesting presentation on the fourth generation uh, district heating grids. And um, I'm trying to, to get the segue now from your presentation into mine. And um, so you, you were talking about um, especially the benefits of lower temperatures in or operating temperatures in district heating grids, um, the enhanced uh, integration of renewables. And I'm actually trying to take this topic even one step further into uh, the fifth generation now or into, let's say, heat networks 4.1. Um, and I will start with my presentation, I guess. I hope everything works. We tried it before, but um, okay, let me check this. And okay. Um, so um, first, I would like to say a few words on the institute we are working in, um, the IE Intech. It's a, a research institution. Um, existing for 30 years now already, started with um, solar thermal technologies, um, a little bit of research on that as well. And now our um, spectrum um, of topics broadened very much. Uh, now we are also um, looking into efficient building technologies, uh, energy efficiency in the industry, um, monitoring systems, and so on and so forth. Everything related to um, energy technologies, basically, with the background of being sustainable. Um, in my presentation, I will, like I said, talk a bit more about the cold district heating um, and cooling systems, um, trying to get it from these low temperatures even colder. Um, a little bit of, on the fu fundamentals of cold district heating systems. Then I will present some use cases from a research project we've just been participating in, um, which just comes to an end now. We are writing the reports uh, as we speak. Um, also a little bit on the temperature levels and heat losses and gains. Um, Christian mentioned these already. Um, I have an interesting graph to this as well. Um, and some must-haves, nice-to-haves and lessons learned for in the context of cold district heating systems, as well as a short outlook and future development. So let's start right away. Um, I'm, we were not only involved in this project as the Zim Cafe, but also in another one called Amsel 2030. 
um, where a new city quarter was supposed to be developed in uh, the city of Amstetten with the mixed use of residential and office uh, spaces. And here in the city center, this um, complex of buildings um, is supposed to be erected. And uh, for this case, we designed three or we proposed three um, supply systems, um, each with a different temperature level. So first we were talking about the high temperature uh, district heating system with supply temperatures of 95 degrees, um, which is considered uh, a third generation district heating system. Um, using insulated steel pipes comparable to a series two standard. Um, the second uh, proposed system is a low temperature district heating system where we basically um, lower the temperatures of the return pipe. And um, also using insulated steel pipes as a series two. And the third uh, system is a cold district heating system, fifth generation then, um, with very low um, operating temperatures between 5 and 15 degrees uh, over the course of the year using uninsulated um, PE pipes. And um, for a yearly simulation, we have some interesting results. Um, the left two bars show um, the heat demand and the heat losses of the conventional district heating high temperature grid. Uh, in the middle, we see the results for the low temperature grid on the, on the right side um, for the cold district heating. And interestingly enough, even though we don't use any insulation for the cold district heating system, we can not only halve the losses, but um, yeah, just cut them down to a relative losses around 7% compared to relatively high losses for a high temperature uh, solution with almost 30%. Um, of the um, overall yearly heat demand. And this shows a little bit the potential of um, not only lowering the, the temperatures in conventional district heating grids, but also the potential of these new developed cold district heating grids. Um, oops, sorry. Um, another interesting result to this is um, that Shown here now are the um, temperatures in the district heating and uh, in the cold district heating distribution grid. So the temperature of the cold pipe and the hot pipe in blue and orange, respectively, as well as the sinoid um, representation of the ground temperature where the pipes are buried. And um, we see that in some cases of the year, so this is one year now, uh, we see that in some cases the ground temperature is actually higher than the temperature of the cold uh, side pipe, uh, which means that we don't only have heat losses in the system, but also heat gains. And um, if I summarize this, or I, I summarize this in, in this graph now, um, if we look on the um, summary of the bar with the six um, degree average ground temperature where the pipes are buried, then we see that the energy balance around the cold pipe almost amounts to zero over the course of the year, and we only have losses from the from the hot pipe. Of course, if we go further to the left, if we have higher average ground temperatures, then um, the losses uh, yeah turn around and become gains basically. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So to the fundamentals of these cold district heating grids, um, we are talking about temperatures in the range of 5 to 35 degrees Celsius, uh, which enables um, very good integration of renewable energies um, due to higher efficiencies with lower operating temperatures. And it also increases the potential of um, the use of waste heat from industrial processes. And lower temperatures, as shown already, also mean lower heat losses from the grid. And we can potentially use, like said already as well, uninsulated pipes, which lower not only the investment, but also um, lead to an easier installation as shown in Christian's presentation already. Um, and Christian also mentioned that the transition from the centralized uh, district heating system systems towards the non-centralized or decentralized um, heating systems takes place in these um, cold DHC systems where we are talking about 
decentralized energy centrals, which consist of heat pumps, heat exchangers, etc., which are connected to this cold district heating source or grid, respectively, and then use this heat with the heat pump to um, supply um, according temperature levels on the secondary side for um, the supplied areas. Um, in order to carry um, heat from uh, the, the cooling season, basically the summer into the, the heating season in the winter, um, it is necessary to uh, utilize long-term heat storages, and these can be, for example, in the form of borehole storages. I will show it in some examples that are coming up now. Um, yeah, so I was talking about this uh, big project, which is coming to an end now after two years. Um, we were involved with the Swiss company and, uh, for example, the Energy Institute for Alberg and uh, colleagues from the Technical University of Graz. And we were investigating uh, the potentials of cold district heating uh, and cooling grids and what the barriers are. We developed simulation models and um, yeah, made a lot of uh, investigations around the whole system. And a very popular and very good and well documented as well as well measured case is the case of the German word Familienheimgenossenschaft Zurich, which is a living quarter existing of uh, around 2,500 buildings or 5,500 inhabitants. And as shown in the picture on the right side, there are two um, big server farms, uh, one from a um, telecommunication service and one from a Swiss bank. And they have two um, server farms which are quite big and they supply heat all around the year at around 35 degrees. And um, this heat then is transferred into the primary cold uh, district heating grid, um, the blue line shown in the, in the picture. Um, this heat then is used at the decentralized um, heat pumps or energy centrals, which yeah, transpose the, the heat to reusable temperature level for the consumer and supplying the secondary let's call conventional uh, higher temperature um, district heating grids, which are then on a smaller scale. And uh, in this case, um, shown also in the picture, the borehole storages are um, comparatively big installations where we are talking about 150 to 180 uh, boreholes in a grid-like um, constellation with distances between each borehole of around five meters. So these boreholes are not considered to be a source, but a, a heat storage, a seasonal heat storage. Um, we use this case um, to validate our simulation models because they are very, like I said, very uh, well monitored already. And use this to apply for other use cases. For example, there's a hospital complex, uh, which now is uh, being heated with gas and even oil in some buildings. Uh, and um, the whole area, the whole complex is going to be refurbished. So there's going to be new buildings to be built. And the idea was to, to get a new um, heating and cooling system. And since there is a lot of waste heat available on this hospital complex due to the clinical machines and air conditioning, which are quite a lot in this hospital application, um, there's a lot of waste heat and this waste heat um, will be used and has to be used and can be used and should be used. And um, so we were making investigations on how big the system has to be, um, how to dimension the borehole storages to, in order to carry the heat from one season to another. And um, some results are coming here. So uh, we we did some long term um, simulations in this case for 20 years. And uh, the whole area, the whole complex is to be um, refurbished in three, three stages. One starting actually this year already with the stage one where new buildings are going to be built and the first borehole uh, thermal energy storage is going to be implemented. Then in 2025, um, additional buildings are being connected to the grid as well as a new um, or an extended borehole storage. And then in 2030, the final stage where a third borehole storage is going to be implemented and 
new buildings connected as well. In the lower graph, we see that the blue bars represent the cold demand or respectively the waste heat. So the, the heat that is generated by the buildings and the, the, the cooling systems, um, which we can then use um, for heating the buildings in the heating season. And the heat demand is shown in, the, in red. And we see that there's, a, there's quite much more uh, heat available than uh, is going to be used. So even more consumers can be connected to the grid. Um, the upper graph shows the mean borehole temperature of the borehole storages um, over the course of 20 years. And we see that it's, um, of course, it's undulating, but um, the mean trend basically at the end of the this um, timeline shows that the, the mean average temperature is, is increasing. So um, we can definitely um, add more consumers to the grid. So we have some flexibility in this. Another use case is a living quarter, um, which is also newly to be built. In this case, we have no external heat source available. So instead, we had to come up with uh, another way of regenerating the, the whole um, system, the whole storage, basically. And um, for this case, we used solar thermal or PVT connectors, the combination of photovoltaic and thermal connectors, um, to supply this um, living quarter area. And investigations we made um, on uh, the number of collectors we need to install versus the number of boreholes that need to be installed and shown in the graph on the right side is the relative energy difference in heating demand which um, occurs um, at the given uh, number of PVT connectors and boreholes. So the axis at the bottom from the, the, the PVT connectors show an increase from 500 collectors to 2,500 collectors, and the number of boreholes is being increased from um, 90 to 300 boreholes. And we see, of course, the lower the number of collectors and the lower the number of um, boreholes we uh, use, the higher are the deficits. And there's like a, a sweet spot at the at the top, this this light green area at the top where it starts um, being okay where it's um, energetically possible to install such a system, but it turned out that the um, economical performance um, is absolutely inferior to um, more conventional grids, for example, a biomass district heating grid with lower temperatures, so also a fourth generation district heating grid. Um, yeah, so this was one of the main hurdles that we came across that it's energetically possible, but economically not affordable, which is kind of sad, but that's nice. So um, some main takeaways from the um, project we had was that waste heat, a waste heat source on site is basically indispensable, or you would rather actually go the other way around and see if you have a big waste heat potential in an area and then design the um, district heating and cooling grid around it. Um, of course, the political and economic, economic boundaries are very essential for the successful implementation and the performance of the grid. Um, we always stand in front of a chicken and egg dilemma. And what I mean by that is what came first, the demand or the uh, supply. And that's what I said already with the waste heat potential, um, which way around to go with this. Um, if someone is interested, for example, in an area to um, settle down their business and they want to have an estimate on the energy price or the, the heating price they have to pay, then it's kind of a, a, a catch-22 or a play vice versa because his connection to the grid influences the grid so much that um, we might have lower performances with all the co components and maybe reach higher um, uh, heating costs or the other way around. Maybe his connection to the grid will improve the performance of the grid heavily so that we will get lower prices. And um, what is still um, on the way to, to transition from a, a fourth into a fifth generation grid or from a third into a fifth generation 
uh, grid overall is that um, there needs to be an awareness for waste heat, that heat at the temperature level around 30 degree is still usable and it's not to be wasted. Um, some follow-up questions and scientific questions from this project were how can we model the um, buildings and the heat pumps a bit more accurate uh, to have kind of a model predictive control to optimize um, the economic performance of, for example, the grid connected heat pumps. How can a digital twin for a building and the grid improve the performance? Um, where do we see potentials for load management or respectively sector coupling, where we can achieve peak shaving on consumer sites? as well as the integration of other um, renewable energy sources like wastewater and so on and so forth. Um, I think I'm good on time, so I will actually go on and uh, tell you a little bit of a project that just started yesterday, actually. Um, a project that we are starting to work on right now. This is like then the, the next step from the cold district heating grid, where we not only talk about the the sector coupling of electrical grid and um, district and district heating and cooling grid, but also go a step further and implement um, biological circles and social economical circles and kind of a circular economy on different um, levels. And for this, there's a, also a new living quarter to be developed. Um, which is in, in design right now, uh, the start of the building process will be at the end of the year. And uh, there's this energy system we are looking on, this, this energy grid or cold district heating grid implementing different um, extensions. And this grid and uh, building area is also going to be developed in different phases. And um, with each phase, new components, um, even going with the electrical integration, going to a overall integrated system at the end is the goal. So I think we yeah, got a nice overview now of um, where to go and um, what are the hurdles and um, what can be improved uh, overall in these fourth and fifth generation district heating grids. Um, thank you very much for your attention and here are some credentials if you are interested, especially in this cold district heating uh, project as the Zim Cafe, then you can either scan the QR code on the lower right side, or you can also find it on the project uh, homepage, which is, which is shown at the bottom. Um, yeah, thank you very much. That's it from my side. Thank you, Lorenz, for an interesting presentation. I was certainly pleasantly surprised to learn that these networks can actually gain heat from their surroundings under certain environments. Um, so there's just a quick question from the audience, Lorenz. Um, so the temperature difference of 4K would mean very high flow rates in the fifth generation pipes. And yeah. how would this affect investment costs? Um, the investment costs are not so heavily influenced by uh, the flow rate, I mean, of course, you have to have higher, uh, bigger pipe diameters. But uh, since you are saving uh, the whole installation, the expensive materials, uh, steel, steel respectively, um, you are still even quite lower in the overall investment for the, um, for the district heating grid. Yeah, the grid is so good. Thank you. Um, so I think we can now move on to the discussion. So I just remind the attendees that questions are welcome at any time. Um, you can post it in the chat box or on, or just raise your hand if you'd like to take the floor. Um, so yeah, I'd like to direct the first question to Christian and kind of just moving on from investment as Lorenz just discussed. Um, so with a lower capex and an increased lifetime, do you think that leveraging private investments will be significantly easier for these projects? You're talking about uh, the, the cold district heating you mean, so, or, or generally force force generation? For, for the cold district heating networks specifically. Uh, well, I've, I've uh, Honestly speaking, I have only third-hand uh, experience on that because as we are producing pre-insulated piping systems, uh, we are not really involved in such projects. What I heard is 
that due to the increased pipe diameter that you need to cover the, the, the small delta T, uh, the, the cost of the network is, is not so different to a, let's say, a fourth generation network because the, the pipe size is increasing uh, quite uh, significantly. At least uh, uh, the installation type, I mean the, the, the trenching and everything uh, for the non-insulated pipe uh, has a similar, uh, let's say, extension and, and size uh, as for the pre-insulated pipe. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience which I'll address to both of you. So, have you carried out any research on using water supply networks or wastewater networks um, as a source of energy for these low temperature networks? Uh, wastewater systems we didn't um, simulate or didn't take into account in the, in the research we did right now, but there's actually another project which is should be developed um, where there's a canal system and a wastewater system kind of uh, implemented in the uh, in the design of a of a potential cold district heating grid. But this is only coming up, and we didn't do specific research on wastewater um, configurations or implementations. So. I see Ingo has raised his hand. Ingo, would you like to add some input? Um, just some addition to the remark of Lorenz. So this idea to use the drinking water supply or the sewage as a source for these cold district heating systems, uh, that's discussed, that's also investigated, and there are already some demonstrations popping up here and there all over Europe, some in Switzerland, some in Austria. So it's definitely something people are looking at, and that's also part of our research and demonstration that we have. That's, that's uh, what we look in because, like like Lawrence rightly stated beforehand, uh, there is not really a waste heat because you can use temperatures down to 20, 25 degrees in combination for heat pump quite efficiently. Great, thank you, Ingo. Um, so we have another question about the use of uh, river water as a source of free cooling. Exactly. Um, yeah. um, great. So, Lorenz, do you think, is there any potential to deploy coal district heating networks um, together with renewable energy sources in the absence of a waste heat source? Or do you think, is yeah, that a fundamental a bit of a problem, um, Because uh, the investment of these renewable energy systems, uh, I showed it on one slide with the with the deficits over the year, that you have to have quite a, a high amount of collectors and uh, the investment for this are almost too high to be uh, reasonable, economically reasonable. Um, so there is a there is a definite need for a waste heat source. And like I said already, it's, it's more that you would almost go the other way around, that you, you have an industry that is interested in Getting rid of the heat, getting rid of the heat, um, and if they can sell it to a grid provider, then it's even better for them, because they are saving costs for the electricity for their recooling devices, even potentially water, if they're using wet cooling towers for their processes, and so there is a potential for these uh, industries. But without any real uh, waste heat source, it's it's quite it's quite hard. You you have to tweak the numbers quite a lot. <laughs> I, I would like to add uh, on, on, on that part. I mean, uh, we have discussed that topic with uh, uh, district energy companies uh, and with uh, uh, developers. And uh, what you see, especially with housing developers, that uh, uh, the space uh, in in the houses is, is very scarce. So, uh, and, and decentralized heat pumps um, are not not so welcome, yeah. Especially in in uh, building types as as we know it. So I think there's an other limitation, despite of of cost, and uh, it's also a, uh, let's say a, a limited space. Uh, and so, to our experience, uh, low temperature district heating, uh, typically fourth generation, as we talk about, 65 degrees. Uh, is getting much more common uh, today. Great. And 
So do you think this concept of cold district heating uh, represents a new fifth generation of district heating or do you think it's a subsection of the fourth? From from my perspective, it's a it's a complete different concept. It's uh, if we, I'm not sure if we even call, can call it district heating. I mean, we are we are pumping around uh, more or less cold water. Um, so for me, it's it's a complete different concept uh, overall. So we should we should consider it. Uh, I think there is a lot of of uh, research going on on that. Um, we should uh, not disregard uh, very low uh, sources of, of, of heat. Um, however, uh, if we can call it, uh, discuss uh, it as, as a district heating, a typical district heating. Um, yeah, there are, I know that under experts, and I'm, I'm discussing this in IEA, uh, and, and we are discussing that several times, and it's, we are, we are there are so many different opinions on that. Uh, my opinion, at least, is that uh, it is a, a specific concept, and I wouldn't even call it fifth generation. It's Thank you. And Lorenz has a question about securing um, securing a heat supply for the lifetime of the yeah. network, which I think could tie back in with the data centers. Um, so yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, was... out. Yeah, I was just seeing this question. I actually wanted to touch up on that. It's good that you mentioned it, actually. Um, yeah, this was one of the considerations that we um, took into consideration on, uh, uh, why we made these long-term um, simulations, that we also have to define some sort of fallback scenarios. If, for example, one data center decides after 10 years, OK, we want to move somewhere else, um, uh, because they just want to relocate, then we are missing a lot of um, heat on the primary side. So it's quite hard to really bound these um, waste heat producers to, a, or with, with a contract, really, that they have to um, supply this, this heat for this in this time. You can make it on a short term, but this is not further than five years, maybe because the, the, the planning of those companies is on, a, on another time scale, basically, than the lifetime of such a heating and cooling system. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very interesting question we, we, we also thought about and scratched our head about with the partners and so on, because this is one of the yeah, main insecurities in, in such a case. <clears throat> And I think maybe appropriate for one of our final questions. So how can the decision makers be stimulated towards choosing fourth generation district heating networks, especially when their heat load is demanding a higher temperature um, based on existing contracts? Well, I, I believe that uh, in, the, in as, as we mentioned before, the renovation uh, uh, wave that, that has to come uh, needs to support it. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will be very hard for, for the uh, district energy company just to go down with the temperatures. The, the, the usual way to, to do uh, temperature reductions in existing networks is doing it in small steps uh, and, and testing the net uh, to, to see uh, which of the consumers is first uh, uh, commenting or, or coming uh, coming back with, with some requests for higher temperatures. Uh, but it takes takes a long time, so we can only uh, take a, a major step forward uh, if we are able to uh, also do the, the renovation of the houses uh, in, in general. Otherwise, I, I don't see a, a big chance uh, to do that. Uh, Although there are a lot of research uh, in on the development uh, to to optimize uh, the house stations, and uh, in that way to probably form some some clusters where uh, you can uh, create sub networks with lower temperatures. Thank you, Christian. And I think you've inadvertently answered Alessandro's question about how to roll this out at city scale. And um, the key is to take small steps. 
um, as <coughs> as the network progresses. Um, so I think we're coming towards the end of the webinar now, and there don't seem to be too many more questions in the chat box. So Christian, I'd like to invite you to um, deliver the summary slide you have prepared. Yeah, thank you very much uh, once again. Um, all for all you, uh, all participants, uh, I think we had uh, two uh, very interesting uh, presentations on, on, on two different concepts. Uh, I still see uh, heat networks uh, 4.0 as a typically low temperature district heating systems uh, that uh, is already successfully installed. I think we are probably not aware uh, that this is uh, a very wide, uh, widely used system. Uh, cold district heating is uh, a very specific concept uh, and from my experience very different to certain fourth generation uh, and it is still let's say in uh, very much in uh, research uh, and, and development stage. Important uh, for, for all of us uh, to uh, see that we have challenges for fourth generation in, in all phases. Uh, in, in the design phase uh, to choose the right system, the, uh, the right combination, and really recommend to look for the, the best uh, insulated systems. Uh, uh, then on the installation side, uh, look for alternatives, look for, for uh, flexible piping systems. And in the operation, uh, you, you don't have uh, to, to stand still, you have to uh, optimize all the time. And that I've learned again uh, last week when I've visited our Landscom project. You've seen two different, uh, let's say, approaches from AE Intec and, and Austoflex. Uh, both uh, experts are very happy to uh, go into your uh, specific projects and your questions. So please contact us, use uh, the opportunity, uh, not uh, just here in the in the seminar, but uh, in the ongoing time. We are happy uh, to answer. Uh, we are happy to join with you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you uh, to our Intec. Thank you to your heat and power. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a great day uh, and let's go for sustainable district heating. Thank you very much. Also from my side, thank you very much for the invitation, considering us to be the experts in this case. And thank you, Christian, also for your very good uh, cooperation and of course the uh, Euro Heat and Power platform. Thank you very much. And thanks to Christian and Lorenz for two very interesting presentations and to our audience for participating. And yep. I'd just like to remind everyone that your Heat and Power's Mix, Mingle and Meet sessions um, begin tomorrow. Um, so we hope you'll join us for an informal chat about district heating. And I think we can close here and I hope everyone has a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>